in the midst of the burial liturgy, in the service of committal, we hear these haunting words, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. It's an inescapably haunting moment when we hear those words, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. I looked up the word poignant this week just to be sure of the definition. Poignant means painfully affecting the feelings, also piercing, and also deeply affecting. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. I was reminded also this week of the Ash Wednesday liturgy when we're receiving the ashes on our forehead as a mark of our mortality. You may remember the words of administration. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. I thought about the burial office this week and the Ash Wednesday liturgy in reading Psalm 90, verse 3. You turn us back to the dust and say, Go back, O child of earth. As is almost always the case, the historical context of Psalm 90 is crucial to its interpretation. Old Testament scholars agree that Psalm 90 was written during the Babylonian exile, the 6th century B.C., Written during the Babylonian exile, Psalm 90 is in part a lament marking the passing of time in a foreign land. We understand in historical context that Psalm 90 is about exile. The author realizes his friends, his family, his compatriots are beginning to die on foreign soil as the exile goes on. The author realizes that his beloved friends and family, compatriots, are now being buried in a land far from home. And so Psalm 90 verse 3 is inescapably poignant and haunting. You turn us back to the dust and say, go back, O child of earth. And then in verses 5 through 6, you sweep us away like a dream. We fade away suddenly like the grass. In the morning it is green and flourishes. In the evening it is dried up and withered. The first part of Psalm 90 is a lament. I looked up lament this week to remind myself of its precise meaning. In its verb form, lament means to mourn aloud. In its noun form, lament means a crying out in grief. The author of Psalm 90 is crying out to God, how long? When can we return to our homes and live in safety and security and peace? It was a haunting question 2,600 years ago. How long? It's a haunting question now. As thousands of people in the Middle East, on both sides of the border and the conflict, are crying out to God, how long? As people of faith, we're to be people of hope. Lament has its place. Grief is something we have to experience and get through. But in the end, we gather this morning as people who are hopeful. Hopeful in the ultimate triumph of God's grace and love. There is a time for lament. There is a time to grieve. But there comes also a time to move forward in hope. 
And we see this movement even within the same psalm. When we get to verse 12 of Psalm 90, we read, So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Even within the same psalm, the lament, the grief, begins to turn toward a vision of hope. In thinking about Psalm 90, verse 12, this past week, I thought about that incredibly haunting verse, Ecclesiastes 3, 1. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. There is a time to cry out to God, what has happened? Why has this happened? But there is a time to ask, how will we respond? There is a time for lament, for grief. But there is a time also for hope. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Is the psalmist within the same psalm recognizing that grief ultimately is meant to give way to hope? A couple of years ago, a very discerning parishioner gave me a wonderful book by Susan Cain called Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. If that discerning parishioner is watching online today, thank you. The book maintains its honored place in my library. Susan Cain, Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking, was on the New York Times bestseller list for I don't know how long, months and months and months. It may surprise you as you see me up front every week, if I'm not forced to be out front, I can be the quietest person in the room if it's not my vocation that puts me forward. I'm naturally very shy and very reserved. I learned more about myself from quiet, that one book, then I've learned the rest of my life outside of the Bible itself. Quiet is a great book on introverts and what we bring to culture if we can just come to peace and accept our own gifts and talents. I mentioned that book because Susan Cain has written a follow-up to that book called Bittersweet, How Sorrow and Longing Make Us Whole. It's just as important, I think, as the book Quiet, though it hasn't gotten quite the recognition in the public. But there's a line in the book Bittersweet that has stuck with me ever since I first read it. And the line is this. Susan Cain says that some of us who are more deeply introspective and just more naturally um, self-critical, we're aware of what she calls, quote, an acute awareness of the passing of time. That's what I want to share with you this morning from Susan Cain. Some of us are more naturally aware of what she calls an acute awareness of the passing of time. And that's what's happening in Psalm 90. Written during a time of exile in a foreign land, while dying on foreign soil, the psalmist asks, when? And why? The author of Psalm 90 had an acute awareness of the passing of time. He says in Lament, you turn us back to the dust and say, go back, O child of earth. But the psalmist was a person of faith. And even in the same psalm, while acknowledging lament, grief, and pain, Anxiety, fear. Within the same psalm, the author sounds a note of hope. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Which is a way of saying, Lord, help us learn from this time. 
Lord, help us to redeem this time. A couple of years ago, I was reading an article. It was an interview with a noted actress. I won't call her name, but she is a quite a familiar face to most people in this culture. And she happens to be a cancer survivor. And the interviewer was asking this famous actress, what's it like to grow older in Hollywood? What's your experience of getting roles or not as you age? As a cancer survivor, this person responded, I have come to see aging as a privilege. And that line has stuck in my head ever since. Yes, there are issues with aging, particularly given her career. She acknowledged it. But she said, I have come to see aging as a privilege. Every time I look in the mirror and think I'm going to see that young bodybuilder <laughs> with that head full of red hair that some of us knew back in the day and can vouch for, instead I see my father. <laughs> I don't feel like my father, but that's what the mirror tells me. But what life also tells me is aging is a privilege. And we're gifted with time. It's important for us to remember the gift of time. On the one hand, we can have an acute awareness of the passing of time and at the same time remember that time itself is a gift. And that gift is, in fact, a grace. Back in the burial office, we say during the prayers of the people, grant to us who are still in our pilgrimage and who walk as yet by faith that thy Holy Spirit may lead us in holiness and righteousness all our days. In the midst of the funeral liturgy, while acknowledging grief and lamenting loss, within the same liturgy there is this note of hope. Grant to us who are still in our pilgrimage, that is, those of us still with time, and who walk as yet by faith, that thy Holy Spirit may lead us in holiness and righteousness all our days. Which is a way of saying, so teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. So I'll conclude with this. I looked at them this morning in my office. I've got a three volume set on commentaries on the Psalms by one of the scholars of record on the Psalms, a man named Mitchell de Hood. One of the great commentary sets on Psalms is by Mitchell de Hood. On Psalm 9012, de Hood notes, the essence of wisdom lies in recognizing the transience of human life. It's another one-liner that's worth remembering in deep reflection. The essence of wisdom lies in recognizing the transience of human life, which is a way of saying the essence of wisdom is recognizing the importance and the value of time. The author of Psalm 118 knew this. He writes in verse 24, This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And finally, this week, as I was finishing up my sermon preparation, I wanted to know how Eugene Peterson translates Psalm 90, verse 12. So I turned to the message, Peterson's dynamic translation of both the Old and the New Testaments. In his translation of Psalm 90, verse 12, Eugene Peterson renders it this way. Oh, teach us to live well. Teach us to live wisely and well.
Amen.